Okay, so uh, just a very uh, brief reminder of what is Secure MPC, in case you weren't listening to Dan Daniel. So this was introduced by uh, Yao, Goldreich, Mikali, and Wigderson. And the idea is that we have N uh, mutually distrustful players who want to jointly perform some com uh, computational task together. And by securely, what I mean is that an adversary that controls some limited subset of the players learns nothing more than the inputs and the outputs of the players that it controls, and we can consider different types of powers for the adversary. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on the setting of uh, perfect information theoretic security, so no, in contrast to Daniel's talk, no assumptions here. Um, and here we have classical results of Ben Oro, Goldwasser, and Wigderson, and uh, Chaum, Kropo, and Damgard from 88. And this is the model where we have a synchronous network and point of, secure point-to-point -point, uh, communication channels between every two parties. But the adversary is completely, it's computationally unbounded. So we have basic, basically uh, two classical results. One is with passive security, which just means that the adversary sees whatever the players that it controls sees, but it, it can't, they can't deviate from the protocol. And active security, in which the adversary can tell the, the players to deviate arbitrarily from the protocol. So in the case of pa passive security, we know that every function or even every functionality can be computed securely uh, in this passive setting as long as the adversary controls strictly less than a majority of the players. And in the active setting, again, every function or functionality can be computed securely if the adversary controls less than a third, even if the, uh, as long as the adversary controls less than a third of the players. So since these classical results, there's been a huge body of work on uh, secure computation, but if you actually look at the protocol, if you want to understand them or explain them to someone, they're fairly complicated. What we try to do in this work is give a new and, I think, conceptually appealing and simple approach to designing uh, secure protocols. And the basic technique that we'll use is that of player emulation. I'll, I'll explain that. And this builds on the work of Hirt and Maurer from 2000. But they had a sort of a very different motivation. And in particular, the results that we get will be efficient protocols. Here by efficient, I just mean polynomial complexity. I'm not claiming anything practical. And this is in, but this is in contrast to the result of Hirt and Maurer, which was sort of more general and inherently uh, higher complexity, so not, not polynomial complexity in the number of players. OK. Uh, so before I tell you uh, how this works, let me just mention some applications. So first of all, this allows us to sort of reprove classical results or variants of classical results, such as uh, BGW. Um, in a way that I think is uh, conceptually simple and appealing. Actually, the fact that this, this approach turns out to be very flexible, so it's not very hardwired to the model that you're working in, and this allows us to work in sort of all kinds of other MPC models that have been considered in the literature. In particular, people have been interested in the setting where all the parties have sort of black box access to some underlying algebraic structure. So if you think of BGW, there's sort of a field that everything is working on. People have considered uh, rings, also uh, abelian groups. And they sort of had to tailor different protocols for these different models. This approach turns out to be very flexible and works uh, also in these models. And we can actually improve on the results, on some of the results in, th in these uh, special models. Lastly, we can also directly get results for distributed computing in the case of uh, sort of uh, Byzantine faults. So we get broadcast or Byzantine agreement uh, protocols directly. Uh, and also there we can sort of prove uh, at least one thing that was not previously known in the literature. But I'm, go I'm going to focus uh, on this part in this talk. Okay, so trying to reprove uh, BGW. Okay, so what's the idea? As I said, it's going to be player emulation. What I mean by player emulation is so, so really MPC gives us MPC lets us uh, securely evaluate say, a function or a functionality. But you can think of a player inside a protocol as realizing some stateful or, or reactive functional functionality. And if we have MPC, we can replace its computational steps by, uh, by a secure MPC protocol run by some other players. Okay, so for example, if uh, uh, we have uh, this player that we want to emulate, it's supposed to send a message, we can use an MPC protocol to emulate sending this message. Using this idea, what we're going to do is to reduce this task of constructing an MPC protocol for a large, so n players, to that of constructing a protocol for just a constant, a small constant number of players, which will turn out to be uh, just constructing the protocol for a constant number of players turns out to be easier. We'll see exactly why. And just for, for uh, the presentation, I'm going to focus uh, first on passive security. 
And in this case, I'll show a reduction from the task of constructing an MPC protocol for n players to that of constructing a protocol for just three players. The reason for three is that sort of the minimal number of players that you need in order to get sort of a non-trivial MPC in the passive setting. Because the adversary controls, if you want to be uh, non-trivial, the adversary controls one player, and then you need at least three for, to, to get a secure protocol. So let's see how this is done. OK, so again, we're assuming a three-player three MPC, secure, secure against one player. And we want to construct an MPC protocol for n players with passive security against a let half, uh, strictly less than half of the players. OK, so our starting point is going to be the, like, the most trivial protocol that you can think of, which just involves a trusted, trusted uh, player. So how, how would you do the MPC if you have a trusted player? We have all of our, uh, all of our players, send the input to the trusted player. This guy computes the output, sends back the results. Totally trivial. The idea is now is going to be to emulate this trusted player by three other sort of trusted players, new virtual players, v1, v2, and v3. So we're going to add new trusted players. So it seems like a not amazing idea, but let's, let's see what happens. So we have, we have these three new virtual players, v1, v2, and v3, who are emulating whatever Tau did in the previous uh, trivial protocol. So these guys were supposed to send a message to Tau. We'll emulate this so we have secure three-party MPC. This tells us how to emulate sort of receiving a message. So uh, these three guys will receive the message in a secure way. They'll evaluate the function that Tau is supposed to now evaluate uh, this function f. So they, they'll run a, a three -party, the three-party MPC protocol that we assumed in order to do that. And then again, they'll emulate sending back the results to all the other parties. OK, so th this seems to be a little weird. We replaced one trusted party by three, other, uh, by three trusted parties. So it doesn't seem amazing. But we did make progress, actually, because in the original protocol, it was secure as long as the adversary sort of didn't control the trusted party. If you think of the new protocol that we constructed, even if the adversary controls, say, v1 or v2 or v3, but just, just like one of the, these virtual players, the protocol will still be secure. Because if you think of sort of v1, v2, v3 running their secure uh, three-party MPC protocol, if just one of the guys is corrupt, we're still fine. So we did make some progress. Okay, so if, even if the adversary controls one of these guys, we're still fine. What we'll do now is, you know, we made progress. Let's try to make more progress. Let's try to emulate v1 by three new virtual players, w1, w2, and w3. So now the picture becomes more complicated. We, we, the, we have our real players, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We have uh, virtual players who are actually participating in the protocol, W1, W2, W3, V2, and V3. And then we have sort of, we just think of them as players, but they're, they're not actual players in the protocol, V1 and Tau. So now what's supposed to happen? The uh, real players are supposed to send their inputs to Tau. OK, that we already know. We can uh, emulate between V1, V2, and V3. Now, in this emulation, v1 is supposed to do all kinds of things. We'll emulate that, too, using w1, w2, and w3. Okay, So we have w1, w2, and w3 emulating v1, and then v1, v2, and v3 emulating tau. Sending message, doing computations. So the computer is a little laggy. OK. Um, let's try to think, when is this protocol secure? So. Say that only, um, say, uh, I don't know, V1. Say, say only uh, W1, W2, and W3 are corrupt. That sort of corresponds to V1 being corrupt in the previous protocol, which was fine. On the other hand, even if, say, uh, V2 is corrupt and uh, W1 is corrupt, we'll still find that. Or it, it sort of means that V1 is honest, and then only V2, in a sense, is corrupt out of the V1, V2, and V3. And kind of the easier way to see this is by considering the following formula. So we're going to have a formula composed of three input majority gates. This sort of corresponds to the fact that we need a majority of the three players to be honest. The upper wire will correspond to the, this honest player tau. It's connected, and each gate is sort of connected to the three players that are emulating the, part, the party that, that is above the gate. Okay, So we have tau being emulated by v1, v2, and v3. And we have V1 being emulated by W1, W2, and W3. OK? And the nice thing about viewing it this way, oops, 
the nice way about viewing is this way. So if you want to know if uh, your protocol is secure against a particular adversary, place just place uh, one on the wires that that correspond to players that the adversary controls and zero on players that it doesn't control, and evaluate the formula. If you get in the upper wire uh, a zero, it means that the protocol is going to be secure against that, that adversary. Sure. The protocol you described is secure even if all of the Ws are corrupt, right? Not yeah. Two of them. Yeah, so that would be one, 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 zero, zero. Then you evaluate this guy is one, these two are zero. You evaluate this thing, and you get a zero. Sorry? So, uh, right, the security actually even if, if uh, all three, sorry. Yeah. So it's better to view the other formula. Okay. So now how, how do we proceed? So let's imagine that somehow we had a, a formula that's composed only of these three input majority gates. And let's say that this formula computes the majority function on n inputs. The formula is actually going to tell us how to design the protocol, how, which players are going to emulate which other players. So we'll just, uh, as before, we'll associate the root with the trusted player tau. And each gate is going to be uh, associated with the virtual player. And uh, the virtual player associated with the gate is emulated by the three players <coughs> underneath. Then the bottom, the input players are just uh, uh, directly implemented by the real players. The input, the input gates are implemented by the real players. Okay, so now, as before, we can just uh, associate ones and zeros with the real players, corresponding to whether they're honest or dishonest, evaluate the formula on, on this input. If in the end uh, the output wire has a zero, that means that the uh, protocol is secure against this, uh, this adversary that controls this subset of the players. So since we assume that the formula computes the majority function, what this, what this means is that our protocol is secure as long as the adversary doesn't control a majority of the players, which is exactly sort of uh, the, the type of BGW result that we wanted. Okay, that's great. How about the complexity of this thing? We're doing a lot of recursions. So actually you can think in, in each uh, level, each, each layer of the formula, we're replacing every single step made by a virtual player by a constant number of steps, which are the three-party MPC protocol that is being run to emulate that step. So in every layer, we're paying a constant multiplicative overhead. So overall, we'll pay exponentially in the depth. And if we want to get an efficient, for, uh, an efficient protocol, we better have a logarithmic depth formula. Okay, so this brings us to sort of two uh, missing ingredients that we still need in order to get a secure MPC. The first thing is, so all we did is a reduction to three-party MPC, so we need a secure three-party protocol from somewhere. And then we also need this logarithmic depth formula that computes the majority function using only three input majority gates. Okay, so let's start with a secure three-party protocol. That turned out to be easy. So first of all, we could just use BGW restricted to, th to three players. That's already simpler than sort of the full-fledged BGW. Um, but we can do better than that. So there's a beautiful protocol by Maurer called uh, MPC Made Simple. It is indeed, as stated, very simple. Its major downside, uh, down, uh, downside is that you have to pay exponentially in the number of players. But here what we did is we just need this protocol for three players. So exponential in three is something uh, we're willing to deal with. Okay, this really shows you how reducing from n parties to three parties, uh, by doing that you can make progress because you can use protocols which in which uh, the dependency on the number of players can be really large. OK, so that's how we get um, our three-party protocol. OK, how about this formula? So again, we need a logarithmic depth formula computing the majority function using only three input majority gates. And this is, you know, this is a completely complexity theoretic question. I could, could have asked you this. It doesn't seem uh, directly related to uh, multi-party computation, even though we just thought that it, that it is. And in fact, it has interested complexity theorists um, even back in the 80s. So uh, Valiant in 84 gave a beautiful randomized construction of such a formula. Basically, the idea is to take sort of a, a tree of like a recursive majority tree um, and then wire in the inputs into this tree totally at random. And it turns out that with extremely high probability over the wiring, this kind of formula will work, will just compute exactly the majority function. Okay, so we can use uh, this construction. 
It has a downside, though, because, because this is a randomized construction, it means we're in the passive setting, so we can just have sort of the first uh, player uh, choose the random coins for this construction, but with some very small probability, we'll choose bad coins, in which case the formula that we get doesn't evaluate the majority function, and then we're in trouble. So this will only get statistical security. So that's a, a downside of this approach. We tried to work a little bit harder, and um, we gave sort of a partial de-randomization of a valiance result. Um, this is based on uh, some interesting pseudo-randomness techniques. I won't have time to, to go over it, but um, if you're interested, I'd love to tell you about, about those. And what we got is a deterministic construction of a log depth formula, again, only with only these three input majority gates, and it almost computes the majority function. It works as long as, you know, let's say 51% of the inputs are on the same side. If, uh, um, if you're right in between, then you're in a problem. Actually, we can do much better than 51%. So if, uh, if sort of 1 half plus 2 to the minus square root of log n uh, fraction of, of the players are on the same side, then we're also, uh, also OK. If you could improve this from 2 to, the square root of, 2 to the minus square root of log n to just 1 over n, this would solve the problem completely. So we're pretty close, but not exactly there. So this gives uh, sort of an n-party MPC protocol with security as long as t is smaller than this kind of value. And then lastly, we can fully de-randomize the uh, value the result, but this is a, a conditional result. So assume under some assumptions, for example, if there exists exponentially strong one-way functions, we can get uh, a full de-randomization, which is sort of a, a curious situation in which under a computational assumption, we can get information theoretic perfect security. So uh, kind of a slightly strange situation. And uh, actually, we can use weaker de-randomization assumptions. Okay, so these are the three uh, possibilities that we have in the passive case. So this is a conditional result. So this was all about the, the passive setting. What about active security? So if you look at classical protocols, uh, BGW, for example, the active setting is uh, significantly more complicated than the passive one. It turns out that in our case, uh, the active setting is not much more complicated. It's uh, almost the same. So the idea now will be, instead of reducing from an n-party protocol to three-party protocol, it will be to a four-party protocol. And for the same reason as before, because four is the minimal number of players that you need in order to get uh, active security. Okay? And the idea now will be to sort of, again, we'll have this kind of uh, formula. Uh, every player will be emulated now by four players. But now we, we want at least, um, we, we want so, sort of at most one of the players to be dishonest. So instead of a, a majority gate, we'll want a threshold gate, which is sort of two out of four. So if two or more are dishonest, then the gate needs to value. If two or more of the input wires are uh, correspond to dishonest players, so they have a value of one, then the output should be one. So that, that's a two out of four threshold gate. So we just proceed as before, except that now, instead of this uh, majority out of majorities formula, what we'll need is a threshold out of thresholds, out of constant size threshold gates. And um, here, unfortunately, if you try to, to uh, do an analog of a valence construction, that doesn't give you the, the correct kind of thing. So what we want here is to get a, the one-third threshold function. So it turns out not to give you that. Um, However, we did manage to directly construct a deterministic construction, which, as before, doesn't exactly compute the one-third uh, function, but a very good approximation. Okay, so certainly if 32% uh, of the guys are uh, corrupt, then we're fine. Again, we can do uh, even less than a constant. Do you have existence result? Or... No. And I think it's interesting to, to give either a, like a non-uniform or randomized construction here, I think, would be interesting more from a complexity theoretic point of view. Um, yeah. Another question. So there's this result uh, by Denor and the Rodney. Yeah. Where they get a half for malicious if they have a ability of broadcast. Yeah. So we can do that too. Yeah. 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 We can get that too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to summarize, what we suggest is a new approach, which I think is uh, conceptually appealing. Um, to designing MPC protocols, uh, which works in a really a large variety of settings. 
In particular, I didn't have time to talk about it, but if you consider things such as a, an underlying algebraic structure, such as a ring or an abelian group, we can get uh, key results there that even improve upon the state of the art that was known. And then we have these uh, sort of seemingly independent complexity theoretic question on which we made, I think, a lot of progress, but there's still, it's still an open question, which I think is more interesting, again, from a complexity point of view. Can you uh, fully de-randomize Valiant's construction? If, if you're interested in that, I can tell you a little bit more uh, offline. So thank you. So we actually have plenty of time for questions. I would really like to see something about the de-randomization. De-randomization? Um, but there's also another question. So. Okay. So, so it seems your result shows that the lower bounds on the NPC setting gives us lower bounds on the you know, the, for formula. Um, uh, like, you mean like the, the complexity of, uh, if you have a lower bound on the complexity of MPC protocols? You, know that you cannot have like, uh, information theoretic security better than, say, have uh, right. more than half our uh, TSONIS. Yeah. So that implies that you don't have such a formula. So, so you can't use, for example, using only three input majority gates, you can't compute the 40%, uh, sorry, the 55% uh, function, yeah. But the, uh, I think it was actually known, so there's a, a characterization, um, sort of a uh, similar characterization of what kind of uh, functions you can compute only using this, this, this type of gates, uh, regardless of the depth. So it's called a Q2, so if it's a majority gates, it's called a Q2 adversary structure. It basically means that um, if you take any two uh, vectors that uh, correspond to a one output, and you look at their uh, OR, then they can't cover the entire, uh, yeah. So uh, in this, uh, you reduced uh, the majority problem to atomic majority problems. Okay? Yeah. And then you implemented atomic uh, majority protocols using, so is there a trade-off between uh, effic in efficiency if you are willing to use a larger atomic uh, objects? Yeah. With, uh, this might give you a more efficient deterministic protocol, and you can uh, try to uh, uh, handcraft a particular good protocol for a small. Um, I mean, so, so to reduce to a protocol for a hundred and uh, or so players. Um, uh, asking that that might give efficiency improvements as well in your protocol, right? Potentially it could. I'm. I thought about it a little bit, and it doesn't seem uh, that it would. Um, but I don't see a reason why inherently it shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, you require you to. You compute the majority function with these three input majority gates. Yeah. Um, what, what if you don't actually compute the majority function, but you allow, let's say, some ways in which the adversary could could corrupt the majority of the players to, to be secure? So in your example with five players, yeah. as was pointed out, adversary could corrupt three uh, those, to be secure. Yeah. But it's still it's a not any three though the three uh yeah, those three. yeah. But so, so that formula doesn't compute majority, but it right. still gives you what you want. Right, so that... So that you that, relax the requirement that you actually compute the majority. Yeah, so, so that's like a well-studied thing in the literature. It's called a uh, uh, general adversary structure. So an adversary that uh, controls this party, that party, and that party, or only that party. Mm -hmm. And that... Uh, there's, so, so actually, in the, the original paper of Hirden Maurer, they were interested in exactly this question, in constructing protocols for general adversary structures. And uh, not not this particular threshold one, but they they obtain sort of inefficient protocols if uh, inefficient in the number of players. Okay. Sort of uh, point. This construction to get adversary structures that were not known before. Um, so the the construction is uh, the, the, this idea of following a formula is sort of uh, implicit in this work of Hirten Maurer. Um, are, are you asking about an, an, an efficient Sort of okay. yeah. like a, a, diff a different. So basically, I'm asking, can you get an efficient? Nah. Can you? I don't know. But uh, did you have did you have uh, interesting adversary structures falling out of your this yes, particular work that we're not? Yeah, the, the different access structures, but still with uh, logarithmic depth formula. So I didn't think about it. Uh, I think that. I'm not sure, but I think for for general adversary structures, you you couldn't hope to get uh, logarithmic depth. Um, and then, I didn't think about it too much, but uh, I don't see like any, uh, like, but, yeah. Yeah, and, and like from, from a complexity theoretic point of view. 
it's uh, directed as the connectivity agency can share with all kind of expect an NPC uh, for an adversary structure to imply even though it's not uh, for yeah. the it's supposed to imply secret chains. So I have a question about the, uh, the valiant approach, which didn't yeah. work out for the two out of four. Uh, is there hope that it might work for five or, or six, or is there some like other constant for which the randomized approach? I think we tried that, and uh, like the direct, the direct thing of like a recursive threshold, recursive threshold gates, it gives you a threshold, uh, kind of a threshold, but the, not the threshold that you would want. So, um, so do you get any advantage? So you kind of you always expand out. I mean, you build a formula, so each player is responsible for only one little kind of thing. So, do we get any advantage if we get like I don't know a circuit? Using a circuit, yeah. so a logged up circuit you can you can transfer into a logged up formula. Like a, a complexity? Um, I mean, like in terms of computer efficiency, I, I'm not sure. But no. you, but you